Well, we will get started and, and um, I will kick it off um, with a couple of intros. Um, and my name, for those who I have not met, are, is Michael Goldberg. I'm our executive director for the Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship here at Case Western Reserve University and also um, a professor uh, of entrepreneurship at the Weatherhead School of Management. Um, and it's, it's a thrill to welcome back to campus uh, to your alma mater, Ross Polari, who's the, um, the retired chairman and CEO of BP. Um, like all of our uh, sessions, they, that we have um, awesome student moderators that, that run the show. And um, Ben Pratt, who's uh, in our um, science technology entrepreneurship program um, with a focus on physics, um, is going to be leading today's discussion. And if you're new um, to these sessions, we love audience questions. So um, please let Ben know if you're watching here on Zoom, just in the Zoom chat, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. If you're watching on LinkedIn, um, just put a note in the comment and Julia, Doug and I will be monitoring. So um, Ross, thank you for taking the time and Ben, thanks for moderating and let me turn it over to Ben. All right, great. Well, uh, we'll start with just a quick intro uh, of Ross and then we'll get into more of the moderated talk and then questions are always welcome. Um, so we'll kick it off. So Ross started uh, here in Cleveland, Ohio uh, at Standard Oil, he then moved to BP uh, at the world headquarters uh, where he worked until he became the CEO of BP's uh, American division from 2001 to 2006. Uh, oversaw the, uh, of course, the American division um, for those five years, oversaw some great things and some uh, tragedies uh, that, that we're going to get into. After working there, um, having a, a nice term, uh, he worked at Zia Chem, uh, and Zia Chem uses or used uh, poplar trees to create sustainable chemicals. He was on the board of directors there uh, for three-ish years. And now he works uh, as a on the advisory board uh, as a member for the CVC Capital Partners. So Ross, uh, it seems like work at, uh, starting to talk about your time at BP would be best. So some of the ups and downs of BP would uh, be great to hear. Well, uh, thanks, Ben, and thanks all of you who joined. Let me echo what was said earlier, which is questions. Uh, would be welcome so that Ben and I can take this wherever you would like to take it. Um, and uh, so please let us know. I think maybe the place to start is that working in the energy industry is probably the most exciting industry anybody can be in. Uh, so I, I have that as context. If you think about it, whether it was uh, three decades ago, last week or next month, energy is always in the news. It's affected by politics by economics and everything else. So the context of my career is an incredible industry, a lot of volatility, lots of ups and downs. Um, when I left uh, Standard, when I left Case, I went to Standard Oil of Ohio in Cleveland, uh, thinking that I would have a regional oil company kind of career, uh, but very shortly thereafter, uh, BP acquired Standard Oil and, um, we became, I became part of a very significant international oil company. And uh, as Ben said, I lived in London for 10 years. I also worked in the Netherlands and also lived and worked in Australia. So a uh, broad background. Um, there were many things that happened in my career as Ben mentioned, uh, some good, some not so good, but overall from a career point of view, I would encourage anybody, particularly any students listening in on this, that taking a look at an industry that is vibrant, uh, maybe even controversial uh, and exciting is a great way to get started. All right, so um, can you tell us a little bit some of the events that you oversaw as your uh, time as CEO? Yeah, I think one of the first things I'd mention is um, I've been head of global marketing for uh, quite a few years for BP before I became CEO of uh, the American region, which is North and South America. I came into that job, was promoted into it in August of 2001. And the reason I think that's relevant is it was one month before 9-11. I had been on the job really only about three weeks when 9-11 happened. And it was my first experience really of having to react very quickly to something on a global scale 
and um, begin to think through what the corporation would want to do. And I mention this because I think it's important background for what came in the future. And on 9-11, uh, what, what we did in order to respond to what was happening is we immediately, within hours, uh, held all the prices at our retail stations for the remaining month, two months, three months going forward. And it was a commitment by the company to recognize what had happened. And for me, that was uh, real encouraging because the culture of the firm was one that said, do what needs to be done to minimize the impact. So we held retail prices across the country, not just in New York. We allocated fuels uh, directly to uh, the New York fire and police departments and, and made a statement that the company uh, would do what it needed to do to help out in uh, dangerous times. I think um, after that, probably the most um, interesting and the most difficult assignment I had with BP was during our Texas City explosion. Ben and I have talked about this before we came online. And again, I think it's an indication of what management people have to be ready for and what you need to train for. And so in March of 2005, there was a terrible explosion at our Texas City refinery. Um, 15 people were killed, uh, another 180 to 190 were injured. And when all was said and done, there was almost $3 billion worth of damages and settlements. And for me, as the CEO of the firm, uh, the first thing we tried to do was to determine what happened. And there were technical people involved in that. I'm not a technical person, uh, by the way. I graduated from uh, Case Western Reserve with a degree in economics. I went on and did graduate work at Stanford, but I'm not a technical person. So I made sure as the CEO of this particular region that the technical side understanding what happened and what we would do was handled. For me, the issue uh, was really twofold, and it's probably the most difficult thing I've ever had to do, and that was to negotiate settlements with the 15 families that had lost loved ones and uh, try to decide how, if at all possible, to do what you can to minimize uh, the impact of that loss, and then secondly, to manage the press. Uh, I'll come back to the press, but for the families, it was very clear to me that the company would support whatever needed to be done. I learned that in 2001 with 9-11 and again here, and I went into the negotiations with those families, basically knowing that whatever they asked for, we were going to give them. Uh, and we tried to get through that as quickly as we could to manage um, their particular personal issues. At the same time, we also had uh, other people who were injured or had affected, who had effects from the explosion. And we tried to manage reasonable settlements with them. And then the third group were the people who really suffered no damage, no danger, nothing wrong, but asked for a lot of money. And so uh, dealing with those people took the longest um, and in many ways was the most uh, challenging, but certainly not the most difficult. From a press point of view, um, it was up to me to be the one on CNN and Fox News and everything else uh, at the time of the explosion. And my goal there was to try to get my message out um, and to main control, maintain control of the press rather than letting the press maintain control of us. And so from a background point of view, I was fortunate. I have had lots of press training, uh, lots of interviewing uh, on television before this but was able to, I think, be able to tell the story of what happened uh, and how we were dealing with it in a way that uh, fit what we wanted to do. So those were the two first things, Ben, that were big challenges other than the fiduciary duty of just running a large company in this part of the world. Yeah, of course. So you talked about uh, the culture of the company. Can you explain a little bit of that and kind of the difference you saw in the British uh, I guess the World HQ versus running uh, the American division? Yeah, I think um, it's probably as much history as anything else. The US division was really the old Standard Oil of Ohio, the old Ohio, which had headquarters in Cleveland. And it was very much a regional oil company. Uh, BP was worldwide, very much an upstream company and um, much more diverse culturally with respect to um, 
nationalities and languages, not so much so in the way we think about it in the US with respect to gender and race, they were focused much more on nationalities. And, um, and Standard Oil of Ohio was a small regional company that was quite frankly, mostly white male. And the culture of the company was not only in the diversity area, but also one of very clear direct management, a very traditional management style. Whereas BP had more of a matrix uh, style of management where we had um, functional heads, we had geographic heads, and they had crossed lines of responsibilities. Uh, an example of that was that when I was the global head of marketing uh, for BP out of London, I was responsible for all of the marketing activities around the world. At the same time, and I was the functional head, at the same time, there was a legal head of marketing in Australia and one in Spain and one in Africa. And so we worked together, a very different style of management. This became even more evident when BP acquired Amico and Arco. And there, there was another dimension of culture change. Uh, Amico had a very direct line type of management, CEO to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. Uh, Arco was similar, not quite as, as rigid in my opinion. Uh, Amico people may disagree with that. Uh, BP had a more open style of management that kind of complemented this matrix management, which is you had an area of responsibility and you had responsibilities and accountabilities and performance contracts, and you work within those. And sometimes you had direct management from above and sometimes it came from the side and sometimes you were on your own. So uh, very different cultures uh, and quite frankly, uh, interesting to watch the blend over the years. Absolutely. So can you talk about uh, when you were CEO, the specific diversity initiatives that you were uh, able to accomplish? Yeah, when I came over to, uh, to the US, I believe it was 2001, a lot had happened already. There was much more awareness um, in the US uh, about racial and gender issues. Uh, BP internationally was, had grown dramatically with Amico and Arco. And the need for talent and the ability to access new talent was really obvious uh, to all of us in management at the time. And so with my responsibility in the US, I tried to focus on the things that were more obvious to us, uh, less than what they were in, in London, they were worried about uh, nationalities and languages and making sure that we had uh, Spanish and French and African and Australian people in the company. Whereas for me in the US, I thought it was back to uh, about race and gender. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud about from what we did then was uh, work with an organization called the Executive Leadership Council, which is a, uh, a black organization that really collects data on blacks in management um, of how their progress, their experiences, it provides training programs. And in 2005, I believe, uh, BP uh, sponsored and funded uh, an institute of learning for that organization, uh, which allowed many junior level African American uh, people of color uh, to come and get training and be mentored uh, by either people of color or white males or white females uh, going forward. And that I think was uh, particularly successful and still goes on today. So I'm very pleased with that. Uh, personally, I got involved with Morehouse College. Uh, I lectured at Morehouse uh, several times, and uh, shortly after getting involved with them, BP PLC in London put the president of Morehouse on their main board globally. So another uh, big push to try to emphasize what was going on. Uh, I think we made great strides, uh, still had a lot to do, and maybe still have a lot to do, I don't know. Uh, with respect to women, uh, we were really pushed to try to get more women involved in engineering. BP is a highly technical company. Uh, and as the percentage of women in, in engineering schools increased, we wanted to access that talent. So we worked pretty hard to make sure that in our recruiting that we emphasize that. For me personally, uh, my staff uh, here in the US went from 
10% uh, women to 35% women uh, while I was here. So we made good progress there. So um, the cultures were very different and in many ways localized from the international side in London to what we do in the US, uh, but similar goals, which is all about accessing talent. Absolutely. Well, let's move on to uh, some of the energy initiatives that you oversaw at BP um, and how you think that, uh, that's a great question. Uh, Brittany, if you'd like to uh, unmute, go ahead and ask that. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to get it entered before you moved on to the next No, topic. no problem. Yeah, I think that this is just such a really um, important topic. It's very timely, I think, for, for the industry. Um, I guess my, my question was, is there anything specific about what BP did that you think made them so successful in, and I mean, obviously, part of it is your leadership, but in, in being so successful in, in you know, getting the organization to recognize the importance of diversity, because I feel like when you try to either bring in goals for women in leadership or African-American people in leadership, then, you know, the, the majority, right, they're saying, well, now I don't matter anymore. And, and now, you know, my, it's not as fair as it was for me before. So how do you, how do you combat that in an organization that, like you mentioned, was predominantly white male? Um, I, I think you focus on two things for sure, maybe more as I think about it. But first you focus on absolute personal commitment. I mean, management has to believe this is the right thing to do because it's about success of the corporation. I think if you think about it as trying to bring diversity into the workplace, then you lose people because they think you're hiring them because you're just trying to change uh, something in the company. But if you're talking about, you know, change the numbers, but if you're talking about access to talent and making sure we get the best people and that the best people stay, it's a much easier and efficient way to get people uh, to buy into it as important and to work hard at it. Because that's the other thing you have to do. You have to work hard at it. You have to go find them and um, make sure that they are the quality that you need in your company. And we found you could do that. I think the second thing is that goes along with personal commitment that helped me a lot uh, was the, the global parent in London believed strongly in diversity. At one point in time, David Simon, who was the chairman for a while of BP said, we will truly be a diverse company when the management team and the board sit around the table and most of us have to wear headsets in order to understand uh, the conversation. And, and I think it's a very telling way to think about what's going on. Uh, I would also mention, and this is, this is public knowledge, that our CEO is gay. And so the concept of diversity in the company and the openness about diversity was one that was uh, easily, easily talked about. But there is no doubt that we had uh, some people in the organization would believe that uh, someone was hired either for color or gender or some other reason. Um, and I think you deal with those head on and you try to talk to them and you try to make sure they understand it's about the success of the company. And if they don't get it, you'd rather they weren't there. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. All right, well, let's uh, actually get into energy initiatives. Thanks for the question, Brittany. Um, so some of the energy projects that you oversaw at BP, um, and I would love to know kind of your views, personal views, and then BP's views on climate change. Sure. Uh, let me start with something where uh, I was certainly not in charge and go all the way back to uh, May of 1997. And I think in, in May of 1997, I was in the US at that time running just a retail business in the US, but it's an important time and date uh, for our company. Uh, at that time, our CEO, John Brown, uh, went to Stanford and in 1997 announced that BP acknowledged climate change, agreed that it was there, agreed that there were many things about it that we didn't understand, including just how much impact humans had on climate change, but that there was no doubt that something had to be done about it and stressed with his belief in the precautionary principle, which I also personally believe in, which was we can't wait to find out for sure 
how much humans are affecting the climate, because once we know that, it's probably too late. Uh, so we needed to start making assumptions about it and working with it now. I happened to be at Stanford uh, with John at that time because we were doing uh, many things around that area. And I think that formed the basis for the company saying, okay, we need to do something. What can we do even though our knowledge of this thing called climate change is still unclear? And also in 1997, BP was the only oil company that acknowledged climate change. The only one that talked about uh, the environment in a way that suggested it was part of our responsibility, uh, along with running a business and making money. And at that time, uh, what we did as a company was we started funding research into climate change with uh, a variety of organizations. We began to develop alternative um, energy investments, uh, very early days, many of them not successful. I'll talk about that. Uh, but importantly, we also said, and I believe this is still important today, actions taken on climate change need to be in the context of the overall consequences. There are many unintended consequences with shifts in uh, how you produce energy. And we made a point back then that this doesn't mean that oil and gas just goes away, because that would be catastrophic economically to many parts of the world. Uh, but that we had to begin to blend, and that was BP's position in 1997. We had to begin to blend uh, the provision of energy with uh, the economic realities of the world. So then through the coming years, and while I was a CEO here in the US, uh, we started a solar company. It ran for about six years from 2005, I believe we sold it in 2011. Um, it was very unsuccessful as far as making money. Uh, we didn't make any money at all. We learned a lot. Uh, and we learned that we didn't have the expertise in the company to manage and run a solar business. And we also believe that the solar business at that time uh, was not one that we could invest in and satisfy our own capabilities and our own investors' needs. We, but we learned a lot. and. As I will come back and mention, uh, BP is back in solar again uh, with those learnings helping to move forward. Uh, we worked very hard on hydrogen uh, during my time in, in the US. Uh, in fact, I was part of President Bush's hydrogen task force out of the White House trying to look at how to develop hydrogen as a source of fuel for the future and um, how the country, the government and industry might work together. Uh, a lot was done. Uh, probably the biggest project we did just to try to emphasize how hydrogen could work is that BP sponsored along with Governor Schwarzenegger and General Motors, a hydrogen fueling station and hydrogen vehicles at LAX in Los Angeles, which I believe is still going on. Uh, the unique thing about this investment was that we make the hydrogen on site uh, we fill the cars on site. Uh, they don't ever leave the airport. They just uh, ride around within the airport. But it was an example of how you could use hydrogen in the future. Um, it isn't practical. Uh, and I don't believe today personally that hydrogen is practical for automobiles. I believe it's more of a stationary source, perhaps buses and perhaps trucks, long haul trucking perhaps. Um, but it's a very difficult uh, fuel, uh, fuel to use. And the vehicles are still very, very expensive. We had five vehicles at LAX. Each one was a million dollars to make. Uh, I assume they're still running, but quite frankly, I don't know. So um, I think back then, and while I was there, natural gas was seen as probably the first step into improving the environment and to impacting climate change. Uh, we tried other things as a company uh, and it didn't work. Today, BP is a very different company with respect to the environment and climate change. In fact, the, the current CEO and chairman have announced that they want to move from being an international oil company to being an international energy company. And uh, that is not a subtle difference. It's a significant difference because it means that their, their plan is to go to market and instead of saying to customers of whatever kind. Uh, we have oil and gas products to sell you to solve your energy problems. Their plan is to go to customers and say, what are your energy needs? And we'll find ways to supply them 
that are as environmentally uh, suitable as we can. So if we can use wind, we will. If we can use solar, we will. If it takes gas, we will. And so I think the emphasis is quite different uh, and the investment profile is very different. Uh, I believe uh, in this coming year, there'll be $5 billion spent by BP in uh, climate related energy investment, uh, which is a very significant uh, amount of money. I think it is important to say that one thing that has not changed is that as we change energy sources going forward, uh, the impact on the economies of the world and consumers of the world has to be managed. So I personally believe there will be a role for oil and gas, mostly gas, going forward as a continuously decreasing percentage of the energy portfolio. But I think companies like BP actually need to make money in order to invest in green energy. And to do that, they will have to maintain uh, their oil and gas business to some extent over the coming years, do it in the cleanest way possible. Uh, but I think you'll see energy companies evolving. In fact, certainly Shell has made big strides here. ENI in Italy has made uh, big strides. Uh, in my view, Exxon reluctantly being dragged along. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see how that goes. All right, great. So I think it's worthwhile to also go into the second company uh, that you. I guess you worked on the board of directors there rather than the CEO. Uh, so what was the uh, what was the difference in being the CEO versus being the chairman of the board? And how uh, how did you interact with your other chairman? You're thinking about Ziachem? Yes. Yes, Ziachem, I, I did end up becoming the chairman of Ziachem. Unfortunately, I'm the chairman who shut it down. Uh, but but Ziachem was a great company and for me, an incredible career experience in that I went from a large global company, international business, which when I was with BP was the third largest company in the world, huge resources. I never had to worry about going to a bank to get debt for my investments. I just went to the treasury within the company to a startup company that had angel investors and a process of um, making cellulosic uh, molecules from poplar trees very, very exciting kind of technology. And uh, the reason I was asked to be on that board, I believe, uh, was because they had gotten the technology to the point where they were trying to figure out how to commercialize it. They needed to build a uh, larger pilot plant. They were basically still working off bench uh, in the labs for this technology, which took poplar trees uh, turn them into a kind of, I, I would call it a sugar, being a non-technical person, and then turning that into C2 and C3 molecules, which could go into industrial chemicals and into ethanol. And um, it was fascinating for me because I had to beg for money, which I'd never had to do at BP, although I'd have to say at BP, I had to justify what I wanted uh, with the board, but it was not quite the same. And it was a technology that was exciting, uh, but really unproven. So I joined the board. Uh, we built a $50 million plant in uh, Oregon and uh, began to produce ethanol from poplar trees. About the time that plant got going, the price of crude oil fell down below $20 a barrel uh, and there was no way we could compete. Uh, the, we had a great process. It made a good product. And if oil is between 80 and $90 a barrel, we could compete easily at 60 or 68, which I'm guessing is around where it is today. I haven't actually looked today. Uh, it would be a reasonably competitive uh, process. But we had angel investors who looked at that dip and that difficulty and began to back out. So we ended up having to mothball the plant. It is operating today as a tolling facility um, but um, it is a technology that I still have some hope for. Uh, unfortunately, when we could no longer pay off our debt because we couldn't find investors to move us along, I had to go to the bank and offer them the plant, which we had put up as security for our loan. They made it very clear they didn't want it, uh, which then allowed us to restructure the debt. And I think the management team, the small group of uh, two individuals who are watching that asset today, 
are slowly but surely every now and then making a payment on that debt. But is a technology that someday may come back and maybe not. But for me, a fascinating management experience versus a large global corporation. Which one did you find more enjoyable? Uh, I must admit, I, I found the larger corporate one more enjoyable because it was more complex. Uh, I found the issues uh, difficult. In a large corporation like BP, when you're in management and you're looking at risk and investment uh, priorities, there is no bad project. Every project is good. And so you have to work very hard and it's very exciting to try to get the best one and to compete uh, within the corporation uh, for capital. Um, I also, I did enjoy the public side of being in the large corporation. Uh, th this is, may sound different when I say it, but I very much disliked appearing before congressional committees on television and being abused uh, on TV, but I also very much enjoyed the excitement uh, and the challenge of being prepared uh, for those sessions. Those are some of the things uh, that I found difficult to do personally, but I learned how to prepare and I learned how to, to handle them. So when you put all that together, uh, it, it was just much more exciting than the startup company, although I would do either one again. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit more about those congressional committees? Uh, yes, I, I appeared in front of uh, the House two times and the Senate two times. Uh, both of them were very long and difficult sessions. If you ever watch them on TV, you'll notice that the uh, members of Congress every now and then get up and walk outside and have a coffee, maybe go to the bathroom and come back in, but the people at the table uh, never get to go anywhere. So it's a very long, hard day. Um, I learned that these congressional hearings are actually important with respect to what they're trying to do, but nothing gets done at the hearing. It's before the hearing and after the hearing that you really make progress. So personally, I find the hearings a total waste of time, but the desire to understand what's going on uh, is not a waste of time. It is difficult to do because government representatives and people in business come from very different backgrounds. So I learned a couple of things. The first off I learned is it's a show and you can't win, they will win. Uh, and so your goal is to provide a succinct, clear answer to their question. Uh, hope that it helps in some way, but remember they're performing on TV and you're not. So I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind. Uh, the other one is that you cannot prepare enough. In fact, I think this is true for any management uh, position, no matter what you're talking about, whether it's a hearing, investment, or anything else. And I would prepare to the point before going into a congressional hearing where with real reporters, I would do mock interviews with real reporters, and I would prepare as such that when I got into those hearings, I was not going to be surprised by any question. And so I think that's critical. Um, the other one is, I learned that when they ask a general question, if you don't say anything right away, the guy from Exxon will answer it. So it was a great way to, to make sure that things were going well. So they were tough. And part of it is the, the need for people like me to understand congressional process, which is quite cumbersome and difficult, and the need for representatives to um, try to understand what business is all about. One example, which I mentioned to Ben once before, was a senator who is still a senator, I won't mention his name, uh, asked me why BP uh, doesn't tell the government its true profitability. And obviously I said, well, we do. And he said, no, you don't. You keep two sets of books, one you show us and one you don't. And I said, no, that's not true. He then produced two documents which showed two different numbers from BP saying, see, here's the one you report to the government, but here's the one that's really true and your profit is five times what you reported. Well, one was an income statement and one was a cash statement. And he didn't understand cash and his staff didn't understand cash. And so the only way through that is to give the best answer you can when you're at a congressional hearing, which is Senator, I would be most happy to discuss that with you 
uh, in your office after this hearing because I believe there is a misunderstanding as to what you've just presented. And so it is a bit of a political game, um, but it is also pretty exciting. Your children see you on CNN and they think you're cool. All right, well, we have uh, time for two questions. So okay. please feel free uh, as the audience to ask anything you'd like. Just unmute and go right ahead. Ross, this is Grant. I, I, I wanted to go back to your time, both with the startup and with BP in working with the board of directors. And I, I'm always interested in how do you get the most out of your board? You know, especially if you're the CEO, how sure. do you get your board to work for you instead of working for the board? You bring in all these talented people uh, and, and getting them to, to really help shape a, a brighter future for the organization. How, how do you best do that? I think the first thing you do is make sure you never surprise them and you involve them. And so I always believed, uh, especially when I was going into BP's main board in London, that I never went in with a proposal to the main board that I didn't already know would be accepted. And that's because I had already worked it behind the scenes. I had invited board members to meet with me one-on-one. -on -one. Now that takes their willingness too. They have to be willing to put in that time. But I think the best way to work with a board is to work with them one-on-one, -on -one, not in the formal sense of a board meeting, but in the sense of a partner on whatever you're trying to do. And then when you get into the formal session of a board meeting, that doesn't mean it's easy and they don't ask tough questions, they don't, they don't push you, um, but you're both working from a base of knowledge that I think is critical. And that means you have to select board members that are willing to put in time. Um, I always knew when I went into the BP main board, especially that board in London, that there were four key directors that had spent a lot of time talking with me or thinking about what I was doing. And there were some directors that, quite frankly, I'm not sure they read the paperwork before we got in. And so I think you have to know your board and involve them early on, uh, but make sure you never surprise them and you especially never surprise the chairman. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ross. I actually kind of want to build on that question a little bit. Sure. Um, so it's kind of about managing relationships and um, expectations of your stakeholders. And I think really more I'm thinking of your external stakeholders because you have yeah. your internal, which are shareholders and your employees, and then you have your exholder, external stakeholders like regulators and government. So um, large corporation like BP, how do they work with them in order to meet their internal strategic objectives, right? So you want to, like you said, make money, generate revenue for your stakeholders, um, but also you have these government and regulatory agencies who are providing oversight and, you know, obviously want to limit some of the, act well, some of the, I guess, social uh, welfare that would be negative to the environment. So like, how do you manage uh, those two kind of, uh, you know, cut, in some ways, competing expectations? Uh, well, first of all, I think you have to have an attitude which says nobody, uh, or let me put it a different way, you're willing to talk to everybody, even those people that you know are going to be very much opposed to what you're trying to do or are difficult to deal with, who don't, who don't really want to take the time to listen. You have to try to force your way in. Uh, so there, there are, were many non-government NGOs, there were many NGOs that wanted us to just stop drilling for oil, stop selling gas, um, and that was all they wanted to talk about. You still have to engage. So I think engaging, even when it's tough, is absolutely critical. Uh, I think also you have to be willing to learn. You have to spend a lot of time understanding where they're coming from. One of the ways that I did that was I joined the board of something called the Alliance for Energy in uh, Washington, DC. They were, I was fortunate they were willing to have me. This was an NGO think tank that spends a lot of time just trying to understand government policy relative to energy. They're neither for or against anything. They're really about just learning it. And it's always sponsored by two senators, one Republican, one Democrat. And I found that working through organizations like that, you can sometimes reach through them to uh, a, another organization or a, a policy part of the government that where maybe you're having difficulty working or having a dialogue. And you can use those third parties um, to do that. 
And so I think it's engagement and it's being willing to learn and quite frankly, being a little humble about your position and, and uh, what you were doing and seeing if you can help. And small steps are big. You always have to remember small steps are big. All right. Well, Ross, thank you very much uh, for your time today. Thank you for the answers and uh, kind of your overview of, of your job and, and everything that's come with it. So I'm going to hand it back to uh, Michael to finish it off. Uh, but thank you again. Thank, thank you, Ben. Thanks for, thanks for moderating. Great. Um, ben, thank you. Wonderful job moderating. Um, you know, Ross, one of the great things we decided to do early with these sessions was sort of put our students in the moderating mm -hmm. job. And it's such a pleasure to watch, watch Ben and others before him guide these discussions. So Ben, thank you for doing that. Um, yes. Ross, thanks for coming back today. This is, it's great to hear your perspective. Obviously, topics of energy and climate change and leadership and diversity are, are top of mind for so many of our students and on campus. And I'm glad that Grant was able to make it because of the work that, that he leads at the Great Lakes Energy Institute. And I know it'd be great to have you engage um, when you're in person back visiting in Cleveland and even virtually with some of the work that we're doing at the university. So thank you for taking the time today. Sure, happy to do it. And, and to all the guests for joining here on Zoom and LinkedIn, thanks for making it and hope to see you at an event soon. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.